Okay, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Pakistan Society for the Study of Liver Diseases, I welcome you all on this webinar on liver transplantation under the corona epidemic. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the distinguished guests and speakers who have been my mentors in the past, except Professor Firia, who has been my colleague. Uh, thank you very much for taking some time out and educating us uh, on this topic of liver transplantation under the uh, epidemic. I mean, epidemic has actually changed the way uh, we live and we are still struggling to find the way uh, how we would carry on as clinicians. And since liver transplantation is very intensive, majority of the patients are already very sick so there was a discussion in the early part of the epidemic whether transplantation should be carried on or the programs should be put on halt altogether. But now I think slowly and gradually, uh, most of the transplant programs are resuming their activity. Uh, and since we have to make uh, some changes under the circumstances, the way we practice liver transplantation, and that was the whole idea of organizing this webinar to bring the experts and the leaders of liver transplantation and have a nice discussion for 40 to 50 minutes. So we'll have three speakers. Uh, each will have okay. 15 minutes and then we'll open the forum, uh, forum at the end for questions. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. So we'll I'll formally do. start with this pray that all of you remain safe and blessed under the circumstances. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce my first speaker, Professor Ruben Firia. Uh, he is a liver transplant and hepatobiliary surgeon in Cordoba, Spain. Me and Ruben used to work together at King's College Hospital under the mentorship of Professor Mohammed Rela and Professor Paolo Muzan. So it is all a team from King's College Hospital, but actually none of them is working there anymore and all of them are working in different hospitals, running their own program. Uh, Ruben Firia uh, has been a great academic and was very fond of research. So I'm pretty sure he's bring, going to bring good stuff. And sadly, Spain has also suffered a lot in the epidemic. So Dr. Ruben Firia is going to speak on the global impact of COVID in pandemic on the liver transplant activity. So hand it over to Professor Ruben Piria. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Dar. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I feel very honored to be sharing this webinar with you, who indeed you were not my colleague, you were my mentor as well, and with Professor Rela and Professor Muizan. So let me try to share my screen. Yes. All right. So I'll give my talk about the worldwide impact of COVID-19 on liver transplant activity. And this is the situation today. It's more than 6 million and a half cases, almost 400,000 deaths. And these numbers are huge. And also the numbers are huge in terms of uh, research. As you can see in the, in the figure, uh, since January, almost 20,000 papers have been reported. So it means one manuscript every 12 minutes. So it's a huge amount of information. Uh, since I got the information for, from Professor Dar, I screen literature every, uh, every day, every two days. So in the last two weeks, more than 50 papers have appeared regarding liver transplant activity and COVID. So I will make my best to give you the uh, most updated results, but I'm not sure whether in two months with 200 papers more. This will be outdated, but I will, I will do my best. So certainly there's, there has been a reduced transplant activity. Uh, and I think that the four pillars in which it has based is first, we did not know how to test positivity on donors. The second pillar where we were all concerned about the safety of our surgical teams. Third, we did not know the impact on the outcomes of our recipients. And four, we were unsure about the availability of ICU beds. So starting first with donor positivity, 
it doesn't matter what meta-analysis you go for, what study you go for, you will find out that sensitivities, even though they are high, the confidence intervals are not that good. So this is the real situation in a population with 80% positive cases. What you will have is that almost 56 will be positive, but this is the real situation. The real situation is that there will be about 15 to 20% who will be false negative. And we were all concerned about that in the early terms of this pandemic. So we have learned about test, test, and retest. And even though we, we, we were uh, sure that the patient, uh, even, even if we have a negative test, we, were, we knew that clinical uh, suspicion was high, we should retest. What was the second factor that I think that had a huge impact on, on transplant activity? The safety of surgical team. Uh, uh, thousands of healthcare providers have been infected by COVID-19 and hundreds of deaths have been reported from doctors, nurses, and health carers. Um, at some point, uh, this disappeared in the, in the Spanish uh, journals, that healthcare professionals went to war without protection. And that is something that we were concerned in the early times of this, of this crisis. We did not know what would happen if you sent a surgical team from a region to another. So I think at some point, uh, this had a huge impact on, on liver transplant activity. We learned some lessons from the Taiwan SARS syndrome, and I think that this will come in the future for, for our hospitals. Our, hospi our hospitals, since this crisis, will for sure have quarantine wars, transition areas, isolation areas, and everything will change since now on. This BMG opinion uh, happened five days ago. The widespread of COVID-19 infection among Spanish healthcare professionals did not occur by chance. So we have learned that health system fragmentation was not a good idea, that we need more investment in healthcare, and we need proactive strategies for tracing contacts. And I think that at some point, this had a real impact on our transplant activity. Regarding the third point, what was the impact on recipient outcomes? Um, I think in the, in the early phases of this pandemic, we were also concerned about this because we did not know what would happen if we transplant a patient from a COVID positive donor, or what would happen if the liver transplant patient would be infected by, uh, by, a, liver by, a, by a COVID. So I don't know what this means. Um, so we know that I don't know what did this appear here. Okay. So we know that this has been published in Lancet that um, if you operate, this is not on labor transplant population, if a patient's diagnosis of COVID is, undergoes an operation, 51% of them will develop postoperative pulmonary complications. Our mortality will be about 40%. Several risk factors have been reported to increase this mortality. But the conclusion is that post-operative complication and mortality is higher in, than in the pre-COVID era. So surgery should be postponed. And that's something that surgeons kept in mind. We were all trying to not to put patients on risk and we were trying to postpone. So what happened in liver transplant recipients? Uh, I think that Professor Muyasan will, will give you a lot of information about this, but I will tell you that in the early phases, we were really concerned about the fatal outcomes in liver transplant patients because they are immunocompromised patients. And, and so far, the severe cases of respiratory infections were being detected in a high mortality. But results are uh, not uh, conclusive. In some series in the States, you can see increased severity, increased severity and increased morbidity, mortality in liver transplant recipients. On the contrary, five cases from the United Kingdom, from Keynes, uh, report the contrary, less incident, less severity and mortality. In the biggest series reported today is a courtesy from uh, a colleague from Spain, 111 cases, it can be report, it, it has been reported a, a, a decrease in mortality. So at some point, the impact of recipient outcomes in the early phases was not clear. Now on two or three months after the, the, this pandemic started, now we feel a bit more comfortable with the management of, of, of COVID-19. 
On the fourth pillar, and I think it's really important, what were the availability of ICU beds? Well, I think that two things uh, can be, uh, it, it was based on two main issues. First, the ICU beds were, were overbooked with severe respiratory to COVID-19 patients. And the second concern was, I think that we were all concerned about mixing COVID-19 patients with immunosuppressed liver transplant patients. This is an interesting study. It was done before knowing how all this pandemic, how big this would be. You can see it was made by, by a, a group of uh, Spanish statisticians. And this, is, this was the expected availability, the expected needs of ICU beds in Italy and in Spain. And then this was the current number of ICU beds in Spain and in Italy. So it really, the numbers were expected to exceed the number of available ICU beds in both countries. And this was, this was, was it, this is the situation in Italy. These are the number of ICU beds that were needed within one month. And in two months, you can see the situation of collapsing in the, in the, in the liver transplant programs, in the hospitals and in the, in the in healthcare in general. What happened in, the, in Spain? This is the picture, this is a 12 days picture. This is the 10th of March, this is the 22nd of March. And as you can see, the situation in Madrid, the number of patients who needed ICU exceeded the number of available ICU beds. So this definitely, I think from my point of view, was the fourth pillar. How could we do a liver transplant in an ICU dominated by COVID-19? Well, these this, 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 this points, I think they are important. We need to increase the number of ICU beds by using recovery areas, by using theaters, operating rooms, or whatever. We needed to divide COVID positive and negative sectors, test PCR, transfer between ICUs between regions, and use different circuits. So I think that these four factors are the main pillars who caused this, a reduced transplant activity. And what was the result? This was the result in France, for example. This is a paper from last week from Lancet. You see, as the number of COVID-19 patients increased, the, num the transplant activity decreased. Same thing happened in the States, although this drop was not that remarked, but similar thing happened. This also happens in Netherlands, a sudden drop in total organ donors, total organ transplant, and a drop as well in liver transplantation. And what happened in Spain? You know, Spain is, the, is the, the country in the world with the largest number of donors. And at some point, the 12th of March, the government the, uh, dictated a national alarm. So everybody should stay at home. And suddenly there was a huge drop in the number of donors. Not also in the cadaverics. There was an absolute stop of living related liver transplants. And as you can see, this also was happening with the liver, also with kidneys, and of course, with all the transplants, just a few heart transplants, few kidneys, but the drop was really remarkable. I'd like to, 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 to remark these, these, two, these two sentences from, from this manuscript from Sherman et al., which I think is important. Although pragmatic, there was a disproportionate resource allocation to COVID-19. We can understand that. It's obviously, uh, it's easy to understand, but this definitely led to a health inequality. And although difficult decisions were being ma made, there was a disadvantage to marginalized patients. And I think that our liver transplant recipients were at some point one of these marginalized patients. There have been several uh, scores we ha which have been reported. I'd like to mention this score, the men's score. It's a scoring which not only using resources for COVID-19 patients, we have to consider a whole picture. So procedure factors, disease factors, and patient factors have been taken into account to create a score, a decision-making and triage, in which a cumulative men score, if you have a higher score, you will have poor outcomes, increased risk of COVID, and increased hospital resource use. And at some point, uh, we had to decide whether it was okay to proceed because the whole picture was favorable, or we had to consider that the procedure was not justified. 
Paulo we, we will talk about this in the future, so I will, I will not, not talk about a lot about this. But I think it's convenient to, to put the focus on the fact that liver transplant was just not a matter of stopping it. We had to consider several, several issues, including healthcare resources and weight list mortality, just not to stop the liver transplant programs. So what is the situation now? I think we are getting better. better. We have overpassed the first wave. Probably most of the countries are now or will be in the, re, in the near future in the second or third waves. So we are definitely getting better. But at some point, I think we are getting much more confident and that we should be cautious on that. We should be cautious on that. I, I will come later on uh, to this point. But however, although we have seen a whole picture of decrease in transplant activity, there were some areas in which this did not happen. I'd like to, I'd like to put the focus on, on a couple of samples. This is a manuscript just, just released from the situation in the States. This is the picture in 2019. You see, in 2019, the more donors you had, the more transplants you performed. This is the picture in February and March 2020. The less donors you had, the less transplants you performed. But at some point, some areas did not follow that correlation. Some areas had a drop in donors, or maybe not, but they kept on doing their liver transplant activity. And you can see there were four areas in the States which did much more disease donor liver transplant than what would be expected according to the previous year or to the number of donors that they were uh, collecting. Simi a similar thing happened in some areas in Italy. In Italy, some areas warranty liver transplantation by using some policies, other things that were the same but in the state, dedicated free COVID-19 pathways, dedicated ICU beds, special COVID-19 donor recipient protocols, real-time PCR and CSCT, and of course, an informed consent. And why I said that we are getting more confident and we should be cautious of that, because some people, some manuscripts are talking about using SARS-CoV-2 infected donors. Some are not. I think it's not the point to consider that. After the years we have used HIV, HIV donors, we may use them in the future, but probably now is not the situation. I think that we should be cautious on that. Um, I think the key point is to make individualized decision making regarding transplantation. It's a risk of donor derived COVID transmission, a lack of therapies for treating it. There's a possibility of severe COVID-19 disease post-transplant. So we should have a honest discussion with the patient and with our team about the risk of death on waiting list and consider individualized decision making decisions regarding the transplant. I would like to use, uh, to, 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 to use uh, my, my five conclusions just to, to show you my last slide. The blanket refusal of organ offers due to uncertainties about COVID-19 transmission, it may increase mortality in vulnerable patients. We must remember that our liver transplant recipients are vulnerable patients. Organ transplantation remains a vital life-saving component of developed health system. We must not forget that we stopped and we dedicated all our resources for COVID-19 and maybe that we should have thought about that in that moment, or for sure we will have to think it in the future. Sick patients are worthy of the utmost care. Transplantation supports social cohesion as it begins in an act of altruism. We should adapt to emerging knowledge. And of course, we, we should have said before, individualized decision making. This is my last slide. I think that liver transplantation in the era of COVID-19 is, is different to the pre-COVID era. We should consider surgical strategy, indication, donor risk and care. We should take special cautions in recipients, in post of care, ICU care, and of course, consider drug-drug interactions when we have reliable therapies. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dunpiria, for giving a nice uh, presentation. Uh, I mean, that is clear from your presentation that the transplant activity has significantly reduced worldwide. But since most of the transplant centers are resuming the transplant activity, uh, so the donor and the recipient issues are important. And our next speaker, Professor Paolo Muzan, 
He is a transplant and a hepatobiliary surgeon at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham. Uh, Professor Paolo Muzan has a special interest in pediatric transplant and the non heart beating liver transplantation. Uh, he has also witnessed the pandemic in UK and Italy. So he's going to throw some light how to look after donor and the recipient issues once we are taking the transplant activity back towards normality. Hand it over to Professor Paolo Muzan. Thank you, Faisal. Thank you, Professor Da. Uh, very kind invitation. I will uh, start straight away and uh, I hope that uh, the screen is shared. Uh, is that so? Yeah. So, um, the, um, I'm just trying to produce, uh, oh, that's, that's done. So my first slide, uh, there it is, yeah. So we heard already the numbers, uh, huge pandemic, uh, 7 million uh, confirmed cases and nearly 400,000 deaths around the world with Italy, as you say, and UK particularly impacted. The issues around liver transplantation uh, uh, and around donors and recipients uh, that you asked me to discuss today are the uh, really requirement of the healthcare resources to perform transplantation, the exclusion of donors or selection of donors, uh, excluding those infected with COVID-19, uh, selecting also the transplant recipients and candidates in this pandemic time, and uh, in looking at the particular state of their recipients which will be immunosuppressed and uh, have more intense and prolonged shedding of the virus and uh, increasing the risk of transmission to contacts and not lastly to healthcare workers like us which are important in the performance and uh, management of uh, liver transplantation. So in terms of uh, donors what is important is uh, transmission and we know that uh, the viral nucleic acid, acid sequences are detected in blood, uh, acetic fluid, feces, saliva, eye secretions and has been found by PCR in heart, kidney, liver, pancreas, uh, GI tract. Transmission routes, uh, we know them well, mucosal contact, uh, uh, droplet transmission, there is a potential for uh, fecal oral transmission and the high concentration aerosol, which is particularly important for us uh, health workers. So it, it has come at some stage the question in this pandemic whether uh, organ transplantation should be put to a halt or should continue due to the unknown risk of transplantation in this setting. And, um, and uh, you know, one of the first articles that came uh, in, a, in a sense reassuring came from Bergamo, from Italy, uh, that showing that immunosuppressed individuals were not at risk of severe uh, pulmonary disease compared to the general populations. And really postulating that uh, uh, a lot of the uh, pulmonary issues were secondary to uh, also immunosuppression modulation uh, and, uh, and therefore uh, immune suppression or could not have been such a bad thing, and maybe even a, a protecting uh, um, way of, for, for transplant recipients. And uh, so there was no reason to postpone uh, or to halt uh, uh, liver transplantations, but um, this had to really face the issue of uh, competition for healthcare resources, uh, which were given at the time to uh, or are still being given at the time to um, patients with uh, COVID-19. In uh, terms of donors, donors need to be screened to avoid uh, uh, potentially transmitting uh, the infection to recipients. And uh, it's known that there are shortages, or certainly there have been shortages, of uh, uh, laboratory screening uh, 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 tests and kits. 
uh, it's important to know that nasopharyngeal swabs are sensitive, but not uh, uh, that sensitive. We're 63% uh, sensitive, so there is uh, quite a number of false uh, negatives, and even more for oral pharyngeal swabs, where you know 60-70% are false negatives. A BAL seems to be the most sensitive uh, uh, method, but BAL has uh, the extra risk for uh, health workers in terms of uh, producing aerosol. Uh, the the stat, the rapid uh, NAC test, uh, need to be available for OPOs in order to have quick results and not to set up transplants without really knowing whether the donor is uh, is uh, positive or not. CT, if available, is uh, highly sensitive for COVID-19 pneumonia, but it's not, not specific. The approach to the liver transplant organ offers uh, by the ASLD uh, recommendations, uh, as you see, they, although it's written uh, very small, it's just really looking at uh, uh, screen test, uh, screening testing the donor and proceeding only with uh, uh, negative uh, testing and screening and, and uh, after screening calling the patient in uh, the recipient in and testing the recipient and again trying to get a quick result in order to proceed with transplantation without delay and increasing the in ischemia time. So the impact, uh, you heard the impact uh, on liver transplantation uh, by uh, Professor Ischiria has been uh, uh, really strong and uh, there has been limited uh, a high influx of COVID-19 patients in ICU beds, so taking these beds away from uh, N-ward beds from uh, potential liver transplant recipients. Not only, but also a lot of us has been redeployed uh, uh, to uh, as ICU doctors for a period of time uh, to look after uh, COVID-19 patients. So there has been a scaling back, uh, or in some countries even an interruption of transplant activity. And, uh, but for unlike kidney, for liver transplantation, there is no um, alternative to this life-saving procedure. So what uh, has needed to be done in, uh, in uh, places with the scaling down has been to prioritize sickest patients and make a, a, a choice which has, is being made almost every day to put in, a, 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 to do a core or more urgent uh, uh, patients on the waiting list that are those that will be directly transplanted in the next few days. And this list should be looked at almost daily or, or twice weekly at least uh, um, because of course it's that things are dynamic and fluid. Um, also there is the, the issue of risk and do of uh, donor transmission and uh, recipient consent issues in the sense the, the, the recipient needs to be consented uh, for also this added risk of uh, uh, COVID transmission, although there is limited guidance because the truth is we don't know much about it. The impact uh, on liver transplantation is clear. You can see the Roberta Angelico from Rome, uh, uh, a former uh, fellow in Birmingham, has shown very early that at the fourth week uh, of uh, COVID-19 outbreak in Italy, there was already a 25% reduction of uh, procured uh, organs. And in terms of uh, uh, translation into liver transplant uh, activity, this has been shown by Umberto Maggi with the, uh, on behalf of the Northern Italian groups, uh, uh, really shown a reduction, a big reduction of liver transplant activity uh, during the COVID outbreak. And this is in spite of almost doubling of the ICU beds to uh, allow more COVID patients to be treated. Uh, in terms of uh, disease donation, uh, uh, one issue has been that of trying to avoid the traveling of retrieval teams to donor hospitals <clears throat> uh, to limit, uh, again, uh, uh, COVID infection and transmission. And uh, in uh, very high risk countries or when they had the peak, uh, there's been a temporary almost suspension or, or deferral of, uh, of, of the disease donation or deferral of more elective transplants. Um, Professor Rella will talk about living donation, but of course, although recipient surgery is essential, we don't, donor surgery is non essential. Uh, a lot of groups do laparoscopic retrievals, and we know that those are under 
uh, strict surveillance right now because they could cause aerosol and there, therefore be uh, damaging for the uh, health workers working in theater. And also the use of CUSA, as you can see, can, if it doesn't work very well, the, the aspiration can also cause aerosol and uh, promote uh, dissemination of the virus. The, the only issue I, I would want to see is also that a living donor need to be again uh, appropriately informed uh, uh, with uh, the consent that there is this added uh, risk for uh, a, of getting potentially COVID in, in, in a hospital and being a COVID patient with uh, um, a um, uh, sorry, a, 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 a person that has received an operation and that may become COVID on top of that. This uh, paper that was briefly shown by uh, uh, my colleague before, by Ruben, is really just a, a, a multi-center uh, survey, uh, which looked like really at the increased burden on healthcare system and how would that work uh, uh, in terms of limited resources with the uh, availability of transplantation. And, uh, and um, it's, they came up with this uh, new four-dimensional model of quadripartite uh, equipoise, uh, really to balance uh, also ethical issues and ethical tension. And it's a fluid uh, uh, dynamic uh, model that uh, in, in depending on, is based on uh, uh, donor graphs, uh, safety, waiting list, mortality, and, and really can, uh, can uh, look at uh, the availability of, of healthcare resources in that moment and uh, therefore give greater availability for, for uh, uh, transplantation if uh, possible. In terms of recipients, we already discussed the prioritization. Uh, we do not want to use marginal livers, we only want to use good livers to avoid uh, patients being needing filtration after uh, transplants and prolonged ITU stay. These patients really want to get in hospital and get out as quickly as possible. Of course, they get uh, uh, a swab uh, beforehand and uh, they get a VAL intubation. Uh, we need to make sure that enough blood products uh, are available because of, co of course, uh, during lockdown, less people have gone and donating in donating blood uh, uh, in uh, out of home uh, there needs to be availability of resources particularly health courses itu beds uh, and and um, as we said prioritization is those with acute liver failure those with very high melts and possibly those at high risk of malignancy that uh, uh, cannot have another taste or another uh, uh, sort of bridging maneuver need to limit as much as possible radiology and endoscopy uh, afterwards, uh, trying to avoid patients visiting at different wards. And after the discharge and follow-up, we try to use telemedicine as much as possible and avoid them coming to hospital uh, if, uh, unless it's uh, absolutely necessary. In terms of immunosuppression, uh, there's no real need to change immunosuppression. So calcineurin inhibitors can be left unchanged if asymptomatic. Uh, WHO uh, says that we better avoid corticosteroids for treatment of COVID-19. The most uh, uh, the management that we've seen in most papers, really, in the most experience around the world has been that of reducing or stopping mycophenolate and is a type particularly in the setting of lymphopenia, uh, which is uh, typical of COVID and is also potentially also a prognostic uh, uh, marker. The other issue of treatment. Uh, uh, I'm not an expert of uh, treatment for COVID, but of course, uh, well, I've tried uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, for a while uh, until uh, uh, the Lancet and uh, New England paper came out. And now they're saying that it's uh, good again to take uh, until the trials are finished. Uh, and trials should resume shortly. But there is no known effective treatment. There is therefore uncertainty of what are the best treatment strategies. From our point of view of transplanters, we need to avoid interaction with immunosuppressants. In terms of a uh, uh, group of patients that have been studied uh, uh, after transplantation that have acquired uh, 
COVID-19 infection, uh, the ELTR and ELITA, the, so the European Liver Transplant Registry, looked at, uh, um, and it's just been published in the 4th of June, at, uh, um, uh, sent out a, a survey and uh, uh, 114, uh, so 77% of centers replied and half of them had at least one case with COVID-19. And in terms of symptoms, uh, the typical symptoms, fever, cough, uh, dyspnea, diarrhea, well, these are all symptoms that you can get after a liver transplant. So we need to be uh, really alert of the possibility of developing uh, COVID-19 in, uh, in transplant recipients. Uh, in terms of comorbidities, the most often uh, seen were BMI, hypertension, and diabetes. In terms of treatment, uh, hydroxychloroquine was the most used. Uh, uh, now we hear that lopinavir, ritonavir is probably not effective, uh, uh, and azithromycin is also not used as much. In terms of mortality, the interesting data is that it was great. It was about 16% greater among males, among patients above, rather than below 60 years, almost no, no death in less than 60 years of age. And of course, more in, uh, in ventilated patients and more in patients transplanted over two years um, uh, ago. In terms of uh, mortality, uh, again, uh, there's been initially uh, a paper from uh, uh, Milan, from Dr. Bori and Mazzaferro, looking at six COVID positive liver transplant recipients out of 150. Uh, um, and uh, uh, seems that, that on, on this small cohort, they postulated that patients uh, that had been transplanted more than 10 years ago uh, were more than 65 years old, uh, male, BMI, uh, you know, overweight with hypertension, diabetes, were at greater risk of death. But actually, the, again, this other paper uh, letter posted in the, uh, the, published by the Lancet, uh, looked at two databases, uh, secure and covid HEP, uh, with a significant greater number of patients. And uh, we looked at 39 liver transplant patients with COVID-19. And they observed, as you can see on the left, that uh, frequencies of comorbidities were not different between fatal and non-fatal COVID-19 cases. So the, the effects of COVID-19 on those with liver disease or liver transplant it still remains uh, uh, unclear. In um, terms of, uh, and I'm concluding, in terms of uh, protection, uh, of course, minimum staff in theater, we need to have the appropriate PPEs, but I warn you, I, I had to use it a couple of times and it's difficult to go over two hours with a full PPE in place. Uh, I, I took it off. It's also very difficult to take it out completely, uh, correctly. And you take it off and it's like if you had a, a shower uh, because you're, you, you cannot, there's no perspiration. Uh, so, so every task is slower and, and difficult, and uh, so I can, you know, team changes may be needed in, 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 uh, if you look at longer procedures. And um, I think PCR testing should be done, you know, weekly, at least in healthcare, healthcare workers. And that, unfortunately, is not the case. And I mean, I speak for myself, but I had it done, I had one uh, uh, blood test uh, looking at uh, antibodies and one PCR testing because I came into, in contact with a potential uh, um, COVID uh, positive patient which, who wasn't actually COVID positive at the time. Hospital in US, UK and Europe uh, have discouraged doctors initially from using masks and basic PPE. I'm not sure whether they didn't have them and therefore that there was a discouragement, but also in, um, uh, in, in Italy, I've heard of uh, episodes like this, uh, and uh, and uh, I'm uh, they really upset me because uh, you know we're not looking at uh, at uh, upsetting patients; we're looking at protecting patients because we know that uh, with a mask we are protecting them more than protecting ourselves. And um, so, so in terms of uh, if we have a high risk contact, at least uh, where I'm working uh, right now. Uh, if you are anyone else, you, you go home. But if you are a medical worker, you have to go to still work under surveillance. But a sick doctor is no longer a resource. So, so I think we've been uh, really uh, 
uh, at least at the beginning, uh, used without being given adequate protection. And uh, up to a few days ago in Italy, coronavirus had the caused death of 163 doctors and 40 nurses. As you can see here, is another example of someone who's been suspended without pay for what? For wearing a mask. And uh, on a good note, this is uh, 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 Dr. Cato from the US. It's a, it's a famous uh, liver surgeon who's been uh, two weeks on a ventilator and has been four days on ECMO and has managed to get out alive. And I'm glad for that. So there are still many unknowns. Uh, we have to acknowledge that there is uh, limited data and uh, so we go, we hope that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we base our, our management on expert opinions or registries that lack granularity on single sender reports that are too small to deduct any conclusions. But uh, I think as we get more experience and better data, we'll improve our management and we'll end up also understanding the costs, uh, we're looking only at deaths related to coronavirus, but actually there is all the hidden deaths due to the fact that we have not done operations for, for cancers, we've not done enough transplants, and you can see in terms of um, uh, the, these curves on, uh, on, uh, in terms of uh, uh, number of transplants and numbers of patients on the waiting list to cross over and having potentially more patients to dine on the waiting list in the future. And I conclude with this, that uh, it's good to have more data, but we may be actually overwhelmed by the data that uh, we're getting on COVID. Uh, so we reach more than 23,000 papers and it's doubling every 20 days, uh, worse than a cancer. Uh, but uh, we hope that we get good data for the future. Thank you. Faisal, we can't hear you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Faisal. <coughs> Still can't hear, Faisal. Ruben, can you hear Faisal? No, no I can't hear no, Faisal. Can't. Ruben, do you want to become the chair? Then I can start talking. <laughs> it would be a pleasure. So, <laughs> so Pfizer? Pfizer, are you still okay? Can you hear me now? I can, I can hear you, Pfizer, now. Excellent. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Professor Paolo Muzan, for giving us a, such a nice presentation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Mohammed Rela. Actually, he doesn't need any introduction, but I'm obliged to say a few words about him. Uh, I think me, Ruben, and even Professor Muzan, we are all students and have learned uh, the skills of liver and transplant surgery uh, from Professor Rela. And this is now a new time to learn something, how to do living donor liver transplantation and the COVID impact. I think at a personal note and from the whole Pakistani nation, we are all indebted to Professor Muhammad Rela because he was the one who helped us uh, taking uh, us through the first phase of starting liver transplantation in Pakistan. And Professor Rela, thank you very much. And now I think there are about seven to eight transplant centers in Pakistan doing a decent amount of work with, um, I think all together, uh, probably we are doing about uh, 500, 600 transplants per year in our country. So slowly and gradually, we are also trying to contribute to the literature. So this is a high time that we have to change our practice uh, about living donor liver transplantation. 
uh, all the registries and different liver based uh, organizations uh, are trying to stop living donor liver transplantation because by and large it's an elective procedure and carries a risk to the donor. But actually we, we don't have any other option here. In Pakistan, disease donor organ transplant does not exist. And that is what we are looking forward from Professor Ella's talk that how we can come out of it and what are the strategies which we can adopt to carry on living donor liver transplantation safely. Professor Ella, hand it over to you. Professor Ella? I think you may need to unmute uh, Mohammed. Professor I can't even see you. Ruben, can you do something? Uh, I, I had one ready. <laughs> the admin. We could, start, we could start some discussion until Mohammed is back on. Yeah, I think that. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Zayom. Okay. Okay. I mean, Ruben, how is it? Uh, how is it the situation now in uh, in Spain? Have uh, transplant centers resumed the normal activity, or uh, or you're still in? Uh, because your your wave was approximately two two weeks uh, after us. Okay. Oh, I see, Mohammed. Professor Ella, can you hear me now? He's still muted. He's muted. Uh, yeah. Faisal, yeah. is it anything that you can do for yeah, unmute? I can, or I'm unmuted. Can you yes. hear me? Yes, yep. we can. We can. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think my internet. This is Indian internet. Um, Tell me if you have a problem in now. Um... No, we can hear you well now. And you okay. can... Okay, you can see my slides too? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry about that. We lost about two, three minutes to reconnect. Um, now, I'm, I was fascinated really by the two talks. Um, uh, is Ruben still there? Yep, I'm here. Yeah, you're here. Um, really, I have a lot of questions uh, for you guys, but um, I'm, I'm just going to touch a little bit of uh, what's happening in India and then what uh, my personal experience has been rather than go through everything else um, and what we had to go through. It might seem very primitive for you, the, the two of you guys from UK and um, Spain and Italy because um, you've seen huge number of cases for uh, the Indian population. The numbers have been quite small. So even though India is ranking number six in the world with um, yesterday's statistics of 226 million and 6,340 deaths, the mortality has actually been quite low in India, but uh, it's always a worry that um, the, the numbers uh, may not be very true. But India is one country which went on a very early lockdown, in, went on a complete lockdown, probably... Um, uh, 1.3 billion people went on a lockdown in contrast to China or even Italy, where the law was only in the northern part initially. So it really scored 100% in terms of the scoring system uh, for effectiveness of lockdown. Maybe that is why we keep talking about flattening of the curve, even though the numbers uh, may sound a bit high, but again, for the population, 
um, I have to say that um, uh, it's not huge for India. Um, this is uh, just to show you um, in comparative terms. Um, guys, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. So the Ruben was saying about elective surgery and surgery and the worries about surgery. Uh, we had a huge concern and as you can see, um, the elective surgery is all significantly reduced. Um, I'm having difficulty guys. I don't know if it is my, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. Click on the screen, uh, Mohammed. not use the, the keyboard. Click on the screen? Yes. But I can't see my, yeah, oh, okay, great. Well, that's very good. So every country really um, went through a um, 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 different uh, phase. And what was interesting from this I see is um, the UK resorted really to the private sector to do some cases. That is what I understand, at least in London. Uh, they took the help of the private and uh, the UK numbers, uh, you, as you can see, went down dramatically. Uh, Ruben was uh, talking about three pillars um, and this slide is somewhat similar to what Ruben put up. And uh, one of the concerns we had was really, uh, there was, uh, even in the postmortem findings, they said there was presence of the viral particles within the liver because um, at least the biliary epithelium has got uh, the angi angiotensin expression of the angiotensin converting enzyme. So it was meant to, the, the liver was meant to have the viral particle within it. In the early days, obviously now it's changing. We had worries about immunosuppression and COVID. And um, most of uh, what we were talking, what we were seeing earlier on was the risk of transmitting from a DDLT to a recipient. Uh, but it's um, much worse if um, um, a donor in an LDLT gets infected postoperatively because we saw that um, uh, getting infected, even for elective surgeries, patients getting infected, um, I think Ruben said about 50% or 30% of them developed um, serious chest complications with a mortality of almost 20%. So this has been one of the, one of the biggest concerns for living donor. And you could see that um, most of the European countries uh, stopped doing um, uh, living donor liver transplantation for that period. Now there has been many, uh, Paolo also showed that there have been many recommendations uh, for a usage of disease donor, most of which saying that uh, the donors, uh, potential donors should be screened. Uh, the time has always been an issue in the early times. We almost um, took a day to get a result um, and uh, it wasn't really practical to do. Um, but in India, really, the organ donation completely stopped uh, during the lockdown. Um, so at the moment, even in Chennai, actually, we, we have not done disease donors for the last two months. There have been some activity in um, the northern parts and in the southern part, but I'm just going to talk about really um, our experience of um, the time and period and happened. Uh, Paolo was there in India at the end of um, February. We were really worried if Paolo was going to bring COVID into India. Uh, he arrived from Italy at that time. So when the meeting finished, uh, we had a, a large number of patients to do. You, if you see the the long uh, the longer bar indicates two transplants in one day, and the shorter bar indicates really one transplant in one day. So we were happily um, operating two living donors um, and one living donor each day uh, in the month of uh, February until really the middle or 17th or 18th of February. Um, when when the WHO uh, declared a pandemic and India were talking about um, lockdown. Um, I was seriously concerned about continuing um, the liver transplant program, the living donor liver transplant program. So I thought I should stop for a week and see what what things look like. That is, that is what I did. So in the, in the early period, I think there were about 15 transplants done uh, in, the, in the first two weeks of um, um, March and then we stopped just to see what happened but uh, then recommendations came which was a little bit aggressive I think in India 
people go a bit aggressive. The Liver Transplant Society of India uh, stopped all um, elective operations. They said you cannot do elective liver transplants. If you had acute liver failure or acute on chronic liver failure, you could do. And therefore, from that point onwards, so it wasn't possible for us to do. They only allowed really transplants for acute liver failure. Uh, so this is uh, what it is. And um, um, so we had to really communicate within our own uh, people to say that there are a number of patients who have worked up and the recipients were getting sick. And uh, we requested that uh, we restart the program. Uh, uh, so in the, in the month of April, I think it was on the 14th of April, really we stopped for about three weeks with doing nothing. Uh, we did, uh, not on the 14th, sorry, we restarted around the 7th of April and did five transplants. Um, the, the, really, the, the procedures, uh, I mean, I was surprised when Paolo said the doctors were not allowed to wear ma masks. My daughter working in the UK also said that um, people really, I, I think that the rules were uh, made because of availability or lack of availability in the UK at that time, I think, or in Europe because people thought uh, doctors wearing masks uh, um, in, in other places than it's required uh, meant it was a wastage of um, resources and therefore really they banned people from using PPE. I think which is completely wrong and it's very shocking really to see so many doctors die in, um, in Italy as a result of this. So, so we, were, we happily restarted and uh, did five transplants uh, we were always worried. And then on the, on the, on the sixth transplant, uh, we had an acute Wilson's. Uh, the mother was completely asymptomatic and she tested uh, positive. Uh, the asymptomatic donor during the workup tested positive. Now, two things happened at the same time. Um, we had uh, two patients with um, um, subacute liver, if not subacute really, acute on chronic liver failure was ventilated in our um, uh, liver medical ICU, who turned positive after they'd been in hospital for uh, four or five days. Now, we did not do COVID tests routinely before admission. Now we do for all patients, anybody coming into hospital for investigation or anybody coming into hospital for any procedure. Even a C-scan or an MRI now get um, um, the um, RT-PCR done before they will have the procedure done. So this was really um, um, early times of our understanding. Now, uh, two patients, so there was one donor who was positive, two, two of the recipients who were being worked up for transplant became positive in hospital, and one of the recipient's uh, wife also became positive. So in our uh, setup, there were four patients positive. In India, we did not have, in Chennai at that time, the total numbers that we were getting each day was probably around um, 100 cases or 50 or 60 cases at that time. Now we are getting each day uh, around 1,400 cases each day. So now the government really came on, a, really got worried about our, our hospital. They thought this was the hot spot. They thought um, uh, the doctors were the ones who were giving the patients um, a COVID. Uh, so they must be contracted um, um, uh, as a hospital acquired infection. So uh, we have um, what is called Indian Council of Medical Research who's controlling all of these um, activities. They came into the hospital. They stopped us from doing anything. Uh, all the elective surgeries were stopped, but we always had the post-transplant patients uh, within within our unit, fortunately, they will not. They did not talking about shutting our hospital because in, in at that time the mood for um, the government was if any patient tested positive within a hospital, they'd shut the hospital. Everywhere else in the world, they were talking about shortage of hospital beds to bring patients in. Whereas in India, at least in I think in most parts of India, even in Bombay, they were shutting down hospital if there were positive cases uh, in the hospital. Now, now they've realized that's a foolish thing that um, they don't, but in our case, uh, they did not shut the hospital down because there is no way we could have transferred all our patients out of our hospital to another hospital. So we went through, um, see, one of the worries for us also was, so they wanted to test uh, almost 200 people 
who came into contact with these uh, three patients. Um, now, we thought somebody is going to be positive, obviously, because they were looking after a patient in intensive care, um, not knowing that they were COVID positive for four or five days. But fortunately, all of the over 200 staff, I think maybe 210 or something like that, who were tested, were all negative. That was a huge surprise for me. Um, that's probably because all of our nurses anyway in ICU are wearing masks and gloves and uh, aprons and, and cap and everything. And actually that protected all of them. And uh, that actually gave me a huge confidence that if we have a proper PPE, we, have to, we should be able to restart. But this whole process of shutting down, testing everyone, uh, putting a whole system in place, um, so we actually were also a designated COVID hospital because the government wanted private hospitals also to allocate about 20% to 40% of their beds for management of COVID. Um, so we had to take in, currently I think we almost have 70 patients in our hospital um, and about um, 12 ventilated patients, in our, not 12, I think there are 12 in ICU, about seven ventilated patients in our hospital. Now, we had to actually separate, uh, physically do some um, um, really um, construction work or uh, partitioning work to fortunately our hospital, even though it's a, it's a single building, it's uh, got a separate A&E entrance, uh, another additional entrance and um, the main entrance in the front. So we kept uh, the non-COVID hospital physically and completely separated and all the staffs were all separated and uh, we started um, transplanting once again. Um, and uh, see, I, I don't want to go through this and uh, most of the uh, existing uh, patients who have had a post-transplant care, we went and went to their houses or where they were staying and took blood. We didn't allow any of the patients to come into the hospital, even though there was a physical separation between the COVID and the non-COVID hospital. Um, and uh, now, currently, we have even made it stringent um, uh, because uh, um, well, my worry, the biggest worry for me is uh, um, a living donor contracting COVID after a hepatectomy. Um, so what we do now, I said that every procedure, they have to have a COVID test done if anybody is coming in. Uh, in these patients, we, before we start the workup, they have a COVID test done before coming into the hospital. And then the workup starts and the whole process probably takes about two weeks time. And then we set a date for the LDLT. And then five days before the transplant, we do a COVID test. And then one day before the transplant, we do a COVID test. Um, so the two tests done reduce, reduces a false negativity significantly. The first test done before they come into hospital is really to prevent them coming in if they were positive. But really the second and the third test done is to reduce the false negativity so we don't land up having a patient post-transplant who's testing COVID positive after the operation. And we also actually do a chest CT. We have seen many patients who have got chest CT findings who are actually PCR negative. So we can postpone those patients as well. So that's been the policy. So this is how it went. Early, um, uh, early March, we did 15 transplants in a row continuously. Some four of, I mean, on four days, there were two transplants. And then India went on a lockdown. We ourselves stopped because we were worried, uh, not knowing what to expect. And then I restarted the LDLT program, um, thinking that, this is an essential thing and negotiating with the government and said that there are many patients who are likely to die if we don't. The fifth patient, the donor became positive, two other patients, and then we shut down. The government really shut us down. And then we put the whole thing, rearranged the whole thing and changed the policy. And then we really restarted, um, um, I think, um, when did we restart? Um, um, 12th of May, we restarted our program. I think we have done about 14 liver transplants now. Um, so things are going okay now and patients are going through without any problem. Uh, we have not actually tested. So they, they have three tests done preoperatively, but we have not had any tests done postoperatively. 
but there was one patient whose chest x-ray, the recipient looked a little bit like a COVID chest x-ray post-operatively, even though he was completely asymptomatic, which made it um, uh, made us worry, but three RT-PCRs have been negative and we have discharged the patient. Uh, so it's not been a worry and it's good to know that patients, post-transplant patients, uh, probably don't have a severe illness if they do. But my worry is the donors. Now, in order to complete the, the cycle, I want to say the 12th patient with a donor who is asymptomatic, who came into the hospital, just the test done, the third test done, just before the day of the operation became positive. For the, for the 12th this time during this uh, numbers. And so we had to postpone that operation. Uh, but this time nobody came to us and said, uh, it's a hospital which is giving and uh, because we were well prepared and we were a COVID treating hospital as well. So things have gone well um, because it's been, we have taken care with all of that. So that's all I have to say really, liver transplant has to go on uh, not just the um, uh, disease donor, living donor, liver transplant will go on. One of the worries, um, as Ruben said, is uh, if it doesn't go on, the, the impact is huge and uh, the mortality, I mean, also the cancer is an issue. Uh, I think when we emerge out of, uh, at least in India, when we emerge out of um, the COVID uh, era, there is going to be a number of cancers which are going to be diagnosed very late and it's all going to have a huge impact on the long-term survival of patients. Um, that's all I have to say, but um, what I would like to, um, I'd like to um, uh, know a little bit more from Ruben and Paolo about um, uh, how um, they did the whole thing, but uh, maybe you might think, you know, we are still dealing with small numbers, but I believe that um, here, maybe in one month time or six weeks time, will be the leader in the world. Uh, we probably will have the largest number. Uh, we might overtake United States, but uh, that is where we are going. It is a worry. The lockdown is actually um, lift, lifted. Uh, um, stop sharing. Um, uh, we, we were all locked down when there were actually no cases at all. Um, but now uh, we're slowly lifting the lockdown and the numbers are going up. Whether, so it's going to be really a delay. It won't be even flattening of the curve. It's going to be um, a rise very sharply from now on. I, I don't know if Pakistan is also in a similar situation. Um, I leave it to Faisal and then I will have a few questions to ask um, Ruben and Paolo. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ella. Uh, I think uh, Pakistan was also uh, very early to start the lockdown uh, for the first four week. Um, and after that, they eased off the lockdown and now the lockdown is completely over. And now actually we are getting more and more cases uh, every day. Uh, and I think our numbers are going to probably increase. And what we are uh, expecting is by the end of June, probably we are going to achieve the highest point in the COVID trajectory. Uh, coming back to living donor liver transplantation, um, I think we are pretty much doing the same thing as you are doing. Uh, we do COVID at the time of assessment. And what we have started to do is we are admitting patient, both the donor and the recipient, 48 hours before the uh, transplant. And on admission, we are going to take their history about contact and symptoms of the COVID. And then we repeat their COVID on that day and also an HRCT. And actually last week, one of our donors, uh, his COVID was negative, which was done about three days before he was admitted. And on the same day of admission, his COVID was again negative, but since we adopted to do HRCT as well, so there were uh, peripheral infiltrates consistent with COVID on a CT. So I, do, I think doing a HRCT on the donor is a very good idea. So that is one thing. The second thing is uh, we have a, a kind of a little outbreak in our ICU. Uh, one of our ICU staff was tested positive. He had symptoms, he was tested positive for COVID, 
And then we did the screening of all the ICU staff. So in the first go, we did screening for 40 uh, staff members. And out of them, 11 came positive, And they were all asymptomatic. And then we have to do another 150 tests, including the staff on the ward, the coordinators, the doctors. And thankfully, out of 150 more tests, there were only two more positive. So there are a lot of asymptomatic COVID uh, patients. And I think the, the, do, the donors, the living donors should be treated the same way. So I think doing COVID on the day of admission, admitting them 48 hours before the transplant, actually you are kind of isolating them. So they are not exposed to their family because most of them are taking these virus from the community and coming to the hospital. And then HRCT for those who are absolutely asymptomatic and their PCR are negative. So that is what uh, hopefully is going to help us. And now I, I we actually isolate them for five days. You know, I told you we do uh, five days before the operation and one, one, one day before the operation. Between those two tests, we keep them quarantined. We have a hotel within the campus, so they stay there. They don't actually come out to, and meet to meet up with people. So I think maybe two days is also not enough because if they have come into contact with someone four days ago, uh, two days is not enough. So um, even if they actually require maybe even one week uh, before the operation, they have to be isolated. I mean, isolating, the, we can make sure they are not in physical contact with anybody else within the hospital. But outside the hospital, it is very tough, you know, how you are going to make sure that they are in, absolutely in isolation. Is there any literature on donors um, having it post-op, developing it post-op? Paolo or Ruben, do you know? I know there have been post-op. Um, I mean, in the Paolo's paper was talking about liver transplant recipients getting, uh, becoming COVID positive and the outcome. But I'm talking about are there much immediate post-op liver transplant recipients becoming COVID positive and what their outcome is. Uh, there isn't, uh, there isn't, there was uh, something that was very small and I didn't really look at it in depth, but there is not really much literature on this. Uh, um, but, you know, there is a recent paper coming into general surgery, really, uh, uh, showing uh, that uh, there is a little bit uh, uh, more mortality. The... Um, uh, personally, I had, uh, at least in Florence where I'm doing a sabbatical, I had uh, three cases of uh, post uh, PPPD, post uh, head of the pancreas resection, becoming positive. Um, and I even had cases, uh, uh, and they survived. And I even had cases, uh, as uh, you mentioned, Mohammed, earlier, which, is, uh, which are patients that develop. Uh, Similar COVID uh, uh, ch CT chest uh, uh, appearance, so ground glass, which uh, we investigated with uh, uh, two or three uh, swabs and then ended up doing a BAL because uh, we were getting negative results and this looked typical. So uh, there is also a paper on, on this on similar COVID uh, pulmonary uh, disease that is probably viral pneumonia that we didn't pick up early before because we were not so doing so many CT scans and now we are doing CT chest scans and we're picking up also uh, similar COVID uh, chest features. So, so um, at this time, I don't think we don't know, we couldn't tell baby donors, but prospective donors, uh, what would be the added risk if they developed uh, a uh, COVID uh, after donation, but um, so we didn't have really a lot of data on that. Uh, Dr. Bilal Hamid is a hepatologist at UCSF. Professor Elahi have probably want to comment on your question. Uh, can the admin unmute Dr. Bilal Hamid from UCSF? Dr. Bilal, is he there? 
Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you so much. It was such a good learning experience for me to understand. And a uh, few things, I think uh, just uh, this is the time that we learn from everyone and each other. So at UCSF in San Francisco, although California was hit, somehow we were not hit as much and we continued our disease and living donor transplant. But your point is such a valid that although we're not doing high risk resolution, but we just had a patient who was in the hospital. We had three COVID tests negative. She was scheduled for living donor on the day of it. She had a positive one, and uh, but the repeat one was negative. So I think now it's also this question about the false positive and false negative, which is making a lot of confusion. But your point about asymptomatic is that we had about close to 9,000 patients who coming admitted to the hospital for procedures or any admission. And we only had positivity of 0.4%. So, you know, it is encouraging that, you know, although we have, but we have to keep a close watch on it. And uh, so my question is that, you know, this five days, you know, which you are putting your patient in the hotel, uh, is it like paid by your hospital or who is like if the patient is paying because our insurance companies will never allow. I think we are very limited by it. It's a great idea if we can do it because our thought is our patient may got exposed within three days when they were at home, which you brought up the good point. So who is paying for that five days admission? Like, you um, know, it's actually self-funding. Uh, if it is insurance, because we have some government insurance, which won't pay for it. But we absorb that cost. We have to absorb the cost um, as part of the as part of the transplant package. But um, if they are self-paying patients, uh, then um, they pay for that. Uh, it's not it's not very expensive in India to stay. I mean, you'd be surprised. It's only about five thousand. Uh, sorry, five thousand rupees uh, in Indian terms uh, for a room in this place, or four thousand five hundred. So it's it's hardly. Uh, when you think about the, the cost of the whole transplant, uh, putting them up for five days um, is, is not a huge, a huge problem. Um, so, so you said that out of some large number of procedures, it's less than 1% were positive. But actually, it depends on where you are in the world. Um, so the number of, I, I think when, when we do tests for patients who come for routine procedures, uh, probably we are getting close to 5% now. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's a reasonable number of patients who are asymptomatic coming for other, other procedures who are testing positive. Um, it, it, everything depends on the prevalence. And Chennai city, where I am, is, uh, is the number two city in India at the moment. So uh, we are getting, I mean, compared to European countries, I'm talking about one city, we are getting around 1,000, 1,200 patients per day now, now at this time in our city. And that is, we don't even know if we're testing everyone. Uh, Professor Ella, there is a question. I think it's, it revolves around the same discussion. It's from Dr. Faisal Hanif. He's a transplant surgeon in Lahore. His question is, how can a hospital defend or justify if a living donor develops COVID-19 infection after the surgery, uh, especially if was, he was negative before the surgery? That's, that is, that's a good question, actually. I think um, um, it, it, that is what we were really worried about. Um, I, I really don't know the answer to that. If I, maybe, maybe we can't. If we, if, uh, that's why I asked if there is any patient anywhere in the world uh, who's developed, who's become positive after the operation. So we know what the outcome is. Um, either that, or if you extrapolate what they have done in general surgical practice, uh, even if the mortality um, is 10% or 5% or 1%, in fact, you can't get, go, on, go on with it. But it looks like um, most of the Eastern countries have restarted their programs without any great difficulty, um, Hong Kong, um, China, um, really um, Korea and everywhere, Japan, they've all restarted their living on liver transplant programs. Uh, and I've not had any reports of um, uh, serious consequences um, in the donor. So 
Um, but um, because we are so dependent on living down a liver transplantation, uh, we can't really shut uh, thinking, uh, we can't justify it. If it happens, what do we do? Uh, we, we don't even know that if it happens, it's going to be a disaster. Um, so I, I have no answer to that. It's a big worry for me. Um, but we have restarted and so far things have been okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Ella. There is another qu question from Dr. Kazi from Toronto. And he says that what's the visitor policy in your center? Uh, at least it's zero visitor policy in Toronto, regardless of the COVID, non-COVID patient. And can we implement all that in Pakistan or India? We have a single visitor for a patient. So we have a one visitor policy. And that visitor also gets a COVID test done before they will enter the hospital. So we have one visitor policy. Ruben, you want to comment on it? Yeah, well, in, in, in our hospital, is it, we try to make it one visitor, uh, but we don't test the visitor. So I think that's, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. I, I, I'd like to say something. Um, regarding um, uh, the manuscripts that have arisen the risk on, on, on surgical patients. Uh, I'd like to remark um, that most of these studies have been done on urgent emergent surgeries. This is important. This Lancet paper, which uh, Professor Rayla was commenting, in which 50% of the patients developed postoperative pulmonary complications and 40% of them died. It's in 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 seventy percent, seventy five percent of them were urgent on emergent surgeries. I think it's a it's a completely different scenario from the perfectly studied double tested uh, living donor. I think it's a it's a really different scenario, and I think we should keep that in mind because it's not the same situation. And even if you test the the accompanying person, a double test the donor, I think that that the risk is is really really, really reduced up to zero. Thank can you. I can I ask a question to to Ruben? And thanks for that. Anyway, um, now are there issues with the blood donation, blood transfusion, um, because the virus has been found in endothelial cells, uh, even in the lungs? the principal damage and the cause of microthrombi is damage to the endothelial cells. If the virus is found in the bloodstream within the endothelial cells, where is the safety of um, blood donation and blood transfusion? Um, because we are talking about, um, uh, worried about transmitting from donor to um, recipient. And I can understand the worry is because the liver's also got receptors uh, for the virus, and uh, therefore, actually, the viral particles can be within, within the hepatocytes. I think it has been demonstrated in postmodern findings that there are viable viral particles um, within, within hepatocytes. But what is people's understanding of uh, blood donation and blood transfusion? Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a very important question. Uh, that's why I, I showed a slide showing that although I, don't, I think that it's not now the moment there are some groups uh, suggesting to use in the future uh, SARS positive recipients because that concern on donor to recipient transmission is under debate uh, it's it's not it's not really clear actually there is no evidence about that uh, because at, at some point we all just drop our, our, our transplant programs and as Paolo said as far as I know as well, there are no reported donor to receiving transmission. So I think that even though we now, now we should be cautious, I don't know what, what would be the evidence in three months time. Maybe in three months time, we find out that that risk is almost inexistent, you know? So I don't know, what do you think, Paolo, about that? There is uh, a paper I was looking now on uh, a single case of uh, COVID-19 transmission and blood transfusion from Korea. Uh, you know, uh, with uh, 7 million uh, patients uh, uh, with the infection around the world, and probably it's three times as much, 
um, because we don't to test everyone. Uh, I think it's uh, much less than what you would expect even by now. So um, it's difficult. But going back to the uh, previous issue, you know, in the in this uh, there is this Lancet paper which came out on the 29th of May uh, on COVID-19 uh, patients undergoing surgery and increased this risk of post-optive death uh, with uh, uh, 235 hospitals. And um, it's actually coming from Birmingham, not from, not from uh, uh, my unit. But they report an extraordinary uh, and almost uh, unbelievable 30-day uh, mortality. Uh, on elective surgery, 18.9%, emergency surgery, 25%. Um, uh, minor surgery, appendectomy and hernia repair, 16.3%. And uh, but I feel that again, in uh, when you have so much data, uh, then uh, from so many centers, it can't be as granular as you need needed to be, and you don't know all the all the risk factors uh, that are involved with this. So uh, you know, I think I think we need to know better. Uh, in, uh, as you say, three months or four months, we'll have uh, probably better data to understand. If there is, uh, I mean, it, it is likely that there would be an extra risk, but I, I struggle to believe that it, it would be that high. And uh, in Europe, uh, you may confirm that to Ruben maybe or, or not, there is the feeling that uh, the, uh, some politicians have said the wrong, sent the wrong messages here in Italy, but uh, uh, the, the feeling that the, the virus is losing power and is becoming less infective or, or less virulent and uh, we're seeing uh, more asymptomatic uh, uh, infections than uh, at the beginning. And certainly we have less uh, uh, patients in ITU uh, battling for life. So it, it may also be that the virus is, is just slowly going off. Uh, thank you. I think this last three questions, one is from Dr. Rajesh, and he's asking the speakers uh, about considering a living donor who was tested positive, but after 28 days of isolation, he's negative. When would be the timelines to reconsider him for a donor hepatectomy? Ah. Yes, Professor Wilson. Would you be happy after two weeks? Well, uh, I had a similar issue with uh, a patient that has been positive for two months. I sent him to another center to do a, uh, this is not a, this is a, a cholangiocarcinoma. I sent him to a, a, a different center to get a diagnosis with uh, endoscopic ultrasound. And he got uh, uh, COVID in that instance. And he remained positive for two months and was desperate to be operated. As soon as he got, he repeated the uh, swaps every week. As soon as he was uh, good to go, of course, he was uh, pausy symptomatic or asymptomatic. We went and did it. Uh, so, so actually, he tested negative twice. He, said he tested negative once, then positive again. Then we had two negative tests because we do two negative swaps. And uh, finally, we could do it. Professor Ella, you want to say something? Yeah, I think uh, I know what um, I turn that donor down permanently because that is the that is the donor uh, fifth donor that uh, we had in the first phase. Um, the the child was holding on actually, and um, we transplanted with the aunt aunt rather than the the mother. Now the the reason for uh, that thinking is uh, that that gentleman asked, "How can you justify?" I don't know who it was doing these operations. That's the sort of thing that goes through my mind. One of the concerns I have about this disease is that we don't know much about it completely. Uh, turning negative may not necessarily mean that the virus is eliminated. Absence of symptoms does not necessarily mean that the virus is eliminated. A stress of um, a big operation like a donor hepatectomy may reactivate, may not reactivate. We don't know an answer to that. 
uh, if the virus can be has an attraction for the biliary epithelium, um, I'd I'd like to know really. I, when Nigel actually told me that he did a, a living donor hepatectomy on a patient who was positive, and four weeks later he actually did the operation, and uh, the patient's done well. So I've got so many unanswered questions that people don't have an answer for. Uh, just because the patients become asymptomatic, just because the throat swab are negative, I believe doesn't necessarily mean that they are clear of the virus because there are patients who come back with symptoms after two weeks and three weeks. And therefore, I was not willing to put a living donor through that risk, which is why I said no to that permanently. But can we do the serum IgG if that donor has attained immunity? Can anyway, we didn't have that available. Um, so we, yeah, maybe I would have, I would have considered that, but um, antibody tests um, are still not available in India. But I think... But even so, even so sorry, the, the, uh, we don't know whether you can catch this disease twice either. So it's uh, even IgG, we don't know fully what, what it means if you're really immune or not. Uh, Professor Mizagam um, Abbas, who is the president of the Pakistan Society for the Study of Liver Diseases, uh, he had a comment. I think he should better come up and talk about it. He's talking about considering prophylactic uh, remdesivir for the living donors. Professor Zagam, you want to come? Can't hear him. Is he there? Yes. Professor Zagam. Yeah, I can see him. He's still muted. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I, was just, I was just wondering because we have to live with COVID. It's not going anywhere. And uh, what we are seeing is that there is an increasing number of uh, COVID positive patients and our ICUs are becoming full. My only concern is that we'll have to continue our transplant activity. And in Pakistan, Remdesivir is going to be available next uh, month, I suppose. I have been told that. So what about giving prophylactic Remdesivir to our donors after they have undergone surgery? Uh, donation surgery because uh, we cannot stop the liver transfer, living donor liver transplant program, and there is a definite donor risk with the surgery also. This was my only concern. The trouble is, we don't know if remdesivir actually would uh, prevent uh, a patient becoming infected. Do we have that evidence? We don't have the evidence. Uh, we only know that. Um, uh, it reduces the severity of the disease slightly, you know, or renders them viral negative maybe two days earlier than instead of uh, eight days, maybe six days. I don't think there is really any evidence that um, it's going to be useful to be used prophylactically. It's going to be useful prophylactically. Professor Muzan, you want Thank to you. say something? Uh, no, no, I was just thinking again about the case uh, that uh, uh, Mohammed was uh, discussing earlier. And I was just going to ask if uh, that child had been uh, an acute liver failure, would, have changed your, would that have changed your mind? Uh, it, it, actually, I made a decision knowing that. Fortunately, the child um, survived to get a transplant um, with, um, with her aunt uh, three weeks later. Uh, I made that decision knowing that, that the child may not make it. Okay. Because the child was going to die of natural causes. I do not want to venture into an area where I did not know what we are dealing with. Professor Allah, the last question is from Dr. Tariq Ali Banda. She's a transplant surgeon in Lahore. He wants to know whether we can Actually, Tariq can be involved. Uh, can we unmute Dr. Tariq? He can ask his question himself. Dr. Tariq Ali Bangash. Can somebody, you have to unmute him. Somebody has to unmute him. Who's managing? 
Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. I think uh, first of all, thank you very much for a very uh, arranging a very nice academic uh, activity. Um, as uh, Professor Hella said, there's still there are loads of unknown things which we are not clear. And especially for us, it is very difficult um, to start again when there was a break for about a uh, month and a half or two and we restarted living transplant pro program again in a very sort of a style sort of environment because the, there are loads of questions which are not answered yet. And if something happens to the donor and to the recipient, I don't know as uh, Faisal asked this question that uh, how we will defend ourselves. But my view, there are a couple of questions. One is about the uh, uh, doing the COVID testing for the donor. Um, is it the facial way which will be more practical that admit the patient 48 hours before and do the two COVID tests or is it Mohammed Rela's one? Uh, in the AASLD, I think they have given uh, that if you, want, if you admit the patient, do a COVID test and after 72 hours, redo it. And if they both are negative, then proceed for the liver transplant. The first question is that which method will be okay to proceed for a living donor liver transplantation, number one. Number two is in the post-operative settings, especially the immunosuppression, uh, will we proceed with the same sort of immunosuppression or we have to keep our immunosuppression on the lower side uh, in, the, in, in the period of uh, COVID, um, COVID positive era? And uh, the final thing, the, the third question will be the consent, like how we are going to freeze uh, in a consent uh, that, uh, that, that, the, that the recipient and the donor, they both should uh, know the severity and if something happens, they should accept that severity. Like how we are going to phrase it for the patient's side. There are th three questions for the, for the, for the panel. Faisal, do you want to answer the first one? I think Hello. it is always better to isolate for a longer period of time if possible, but we have to be practical as well. Uh, cost is one issue and putting the donor in a hotel room for one week, I don't know how much practical it would be, but at least it will give us as a transplant team a more peace of mind. The more, uh, more we retain them, more tests we do and the negative, then we proceed. Faisal, I can justify both, really. Um, when you do two tests, whether you do two tests as two days interval or one day interval, the usefulness of two tests is it reduces the false negativity. Yeah. Because if you say 70% positive on the first test, 70% positive on the second test, you're probably narrowing the false negativity to less than 5%. So that was the justification I had for doing two tests. So you can simply do two tests, even if you do two tests at 12 hour interval, it's as effective anyway. So that is the purpose of doing two tests. Because if the, if the single test was 99% accurate or 95% accurate, you wouldn't not need to do two tests. Now the interval between the tests I decided is five days rather than two days because I felt that if a patient was actually infected only three days or four days before you do the test, it's going to be negative during the, during the incubation period because the average incubation period is about 5.2 days, which is why I decided if supposing in your, in your system of doing two tests, if the patient was exposed, had a high risk exposure four days before, the test done on the second day and the, on, the, on the day of operation would still be negative. Whereas if the patient was, had a high risk exposure, five days or six days or seven days, whatever it is, eight days before the operation, either the first test or the second test would pick it up. If the first test happens to be too soon after the exposure, the second test is bound to pick it up. Which is why I decided on the five day gap between the, the, between the two tests done immediately before the operation. The test done at the time the patient arrives into hospital is really to protect everybody else, to know. So that is not to protect for the operation. So two tests done before the operation is what is important. And both are okay. Both serve the same purpose. 
but I felt that uh, leaving five days serves the purpose of really missing out the incubation period. And Professor, uh, the uh, consent. Uh, somebody else can talk about the consent. Yeah. Professor Muzan, can you comment on the immunosuppression part of the question? Should we change or we just continue with the same? Suppression, thank you. Uh, the immunosuppression, we, we, uh, let's say the consensus right now is not to change much, uh, particularly in the early post-transplant, because you don't want to, uh, particularly in asymptomatic patients, you don't want to go the other way around and uh, end up in uh, rejection and needing again to move around in, uh, in other parts of the hospital to get a biopsy. And, um, but most centers have uh, uh, avoided or reduced the dosage of mycophenolate and azathioprine. Um, and um, so that it's, it's pretty simple. There is a tendency to reduce immunosuppression, I mean, calcineurin inhibitors, uh, in the longer term, so in patients that are already two years of uh, after transplantation. Well, thank and you the much. other thing, as I said, is to avoid, I uh, can't remember which is the drug, uh, one of the drugs that are used that, that uh, um, uh, th there are a couple of drugs actually that uh, can cause interactions with the immunosuppressants. So we need to be careful with that. Well, thank you very much. Okay. I want to, yes, okay. Can I ask one thing to, to, Paolo, to Paolo, because uh, Professor Rela saw uh, their um, a two test program and isolate the living donors for five to six to seven days. But I think our, our hospitals, you and, and, and mine, are quite different from, 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 from those hospitals. So how are you doing that, Paolo? In, how do you think that we can do it in a public healthcare system? Because I, I can't isolate a donor for five to six days, or how are you doing that? Are you double testing living donors, or? Uh, it would be very difficult. Well, I'm about to go back to Birmingham, so we'll uh, restart the living donor program there. But I think in, uh, and in Europe, as you know, there is uh, living donation is not as uh, uh, developed as uh, in the uh, Eastern countries, and it's not as, uh, uh, desperately necessary because you have the resources of uh, uh, cadaveric donations and uh, marginal livers and so forth. And so it's a, it's a good alternative. But, uh, you know, in, if you did it, you would probably need to rely on, uh, on uh, uh, patients that, uh, or, or, I mean, donors, that would be like most civilians nowadays after three months of between lockdown and going back to normality, you'll have to uh, rely on the respons responsibility and understanding of a situation and try to isolate themselves at home um, and wear masks at all times. I mean, which is, I mean, I don't isolate in, in family, but I uh, wear masks all the time, wherever I go in open spaces uh, uh, and, uh, public transport everywhere. So I, th I guess you have to rely on that. That would be the best you could do or go to in a, in a, hosp in a, um, a hotel near the, near the hospital, if you are from another, another city. But here, you know, is, is most patients come from the region. So, so you would have to ask them to isolate themselves. Uh, Professor Ella, Dr. Niaz Ahmed, he's a transplant surgeon in Leeds, now has moved to Saudi Arabia. He also used to work in King's College Hospital. He has a question for you, that how frequently you would screen the transplant team for COVID? Yeah, well, I told you earlier on, we did tests on almost 200 people involved um, uh, in the three patients who tested positive and found that all of them were negative. Um, yes, it is, it is a concern that um, the transplant team needs to, but I'm going to say something which I don't know how many of you would, would be able to follow that. Currently, we are not testing the doctors because if we test the doctors, you have to do the testing every week. It makes no sense to test the doctors. If they're symptomatic, we test the doctors. 
if they and and the doctors have to do a self uh, declaration i think every week or so they have to fill a self declaration if they've got symptoms uh, there is an online thing that they have to do that if they're symptomatic they get their test done if not but we do something else which um, we consider every patient that we operate on as potentially covid positive so the doctors have not the same PPE that they have in, IC, in, in, a, in a COVID ICU, but they almost have an equivalent PPE when they are looking after normal patients. So they'll have gloves, they'll have goggles, they'll have a shield, they'll have uh, N95 mask. So the risk of transmitting from the nurses and doctors to the patient is significantly reduced. We may change it over a period of time. Currently, we are being very, very defensive so the answer is we don't test the doctors unless or nurses unless they have symptoms. And we consider we have PPE for every operation now. So that means the cost of all the operation increases by about five to 10 percent. Okay, thank you, Professor Ella. Lastly, I would like to invite Professor Vasim Jaffrey. He is a distinguished professor of hepatology, and I would say he is a father of hepatology in Pakistan, has trained a generation of uh, hepatologists in Pakistan. Uh, he was the founding president of this Pakistan Society for the Study of Liver Diseases. He wants to comment, and I will also request him to conclude the session as well. Professor Vasim Jaffrey. Can we unmute Professor Basim Jafri? Uh, Dr. Basim has somehow left. Uh, uh, we're not sure, so you can conclude the session. Okay, then I would ask Professor Zaham Abbas to conclude the session. Hello. Thank you very much, Faisal. It was a wonderful meeting. And uh, I can see, though we have consumed uh, much time, but many of the particip participants are still there. So it makes uh, uh, me very happy. And uh, I am very much glad to see so many participants in this meeting. And it may remains my duty to thank uh, everyone uh, uh, Ruben, Paolo, and Muhammad for participating and sparing their time for this meeting. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I think we should conclude. And it's the time to say goodbye to Professor Ella, Professor Paolo Muzan, and Professor Ruben Firia. Thank you very much. And hopefully, we will see each other very soon at some point. Stay safe and blessed. <laughs>